size foresight, poor eyesight, couldn't fist fight, had to overcompensate. Learn to be clairvoyant, see around corners, read signals and warnings, interpret omens, respond to court. Broadcast from later, Erica White, Macy Sue, Udit Vera, and myself, Robert Bolton. And joining us today is Sydney Allen Ash. Sid is the creator and host of Research Podcast, Toenails, and Workplace from Later's podcast with Lane on the Futures of Work and Place. Weak signals are things we notice and suspect may challenge status quo ideas of what the future will be like. We gather and share weak signals here. And just for fun, we rate them. Erica, what's your weakest signal? Okay, so I'd say this one is a bit of an evolution of a few things we've talked about before, but it's a WhatsApp series called Jabu's Homecoming. And it's in Bobwain. It's by Ben Mahaka. And so basically you join this WhatsApp. It's less time bound than I guess regular like watching any regular series. It's interactive because it's a story that's made for WhatsApp. But yeah, it's basically a drama and it's based on um, the everyday life in Zim and uh, South African diaspora. And it takes on this narrative of like the breadwinner but primarily the experience of, I guess, economic migration and emigration. So yeah, it's a WhatsApp series, like a TV series. So are they writing in WhatsApp and they write the story or is it like photos or videos or? It's um, a bunch of that, like anything you can do within WhatsApp, but with an actual narrative. And then I guess the fans or the people who are engaging it can actually interact with it as well. So the characters are like, you can message the characters and they will message back within the group. I think so. From what I understand. Oh, that's so cool. It's like, you know what it reminds me of? It's like Sleep No More or something like that. But like a WhatsApp group where it's like- Sleep No More, what is that? Immersive immersive theater. theater. Immersive theater, maybe that's like the term. Yeah. You go and like, there's like a whole like kind of storyline playing out with actors in this house. And then you can interact with them. You're just like part of the whole narrative. Mm -hmm. But this sounds like it's like very similar in that it's like, you know, you have like people LARPing, you can interact with them. And there's like space, which is a WhatsApp group that is like, sets like the context for this whole theater. This sounds very cool. cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It also Mm -hmm. reminds me of... um, Do you guys remember like last year, maybe the year before, I don't know if any of your friends did this, but that like WhatsApp meditation thing that went around with Deepak Chopra and Oprah. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I'm nodding. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of that. Like there's like weird things going down in WhatsApp, weird interactive media things, maybe. I don't know if you could call that meditation thing interactive media, but this sounds really cool. I wonder if like the people, the fans can like change the course of the story by interacting. Yeah, that I'm not as sure about. They can interact on some level. I kind of imagined it like how when like a you see a chat or like the comment section go off and you get like emojis and stuff, but I'm not sure. It's all done through WhatsApp. So I don't know what the controls are there, but. Yeah, it reminds me of that like Twitch series that I think like won an Emmy or something like that. Um, and in that the fans had control over the storyline. I feel like WhatsApp is like where all the family drama happens. So I like that is like taking advantage of that medium and leveraging it. So apparently I read that 3 million plus Zimbabweans out of like 14 million have settled outside of Zim. And so that's like across like Europe, UK, South Africa, US, a bunch of places, but that it takes on this, also the narrative that just like traditional family life doesn't necessarily work anymore. So it's like, the characters have to communicate over landlines, over like WhatsApp. And there's that drama of like, who's the breadwinner within the family. But yeah, I I do think it's a signal of just like how filmmakers and creators are thinking about experimenting with digital. Yeah, before the internet, I guess, in Zim, the film industry was like a lot stronger, but then, so this like WhatsApp filmmaking is just about like doing something completely different than that. I mean, I don't know whether you can interact with the characters or through the interface at any time, but. It's interesting to think about like real time entertainment in that way. Like it's not really time bound. You're not tuning in at a specific time, like into TV shows, but you can be like, oh, in the middle of the night, this is like what the character is doing. But I guess that's also more labor on the 
actors or like the producers or production. That's why they said it was not time bound just because basically anything could happen at any moment. How do you get into the WhatsApp group? I didn't join, but apparently you just join like you would with any, any chat. That's very cool. I like this a lot. I get so much entertainment just like lurking in like forums and like chat rooms and stuff anyway. And this is like someone like actually like producing that as entertainment is like such a cool idea. It's so fun. How do they make money? That is a great question. Sponsored content. I don't know. Well, maybe it's, yeah. yeah. Maybe this is like a loss leader and this is just like engagement for like other stuff. Yeah, this is like a pilot or something. Or to just raise like uh, awareness in order to like produce something with more of a budget or whatever. I wonder if they do like product placement where they just like Mm. talk about like random products or whatever in chat. Who's the producer of this? Or is it just like a handful of actors? It's sort of how it looks here. I think the main guy is Ben Mahaka of this drama series. It just seems like an odd way to think about like techno culture. I would consider it techno culture or like playing with WhatsApp in that way. I don't know. I think I would think of it as like a type of techno culture, like digital. Where did you come across it, Erica? Like screen cultures on an arena. I think also because it ties in with themes of like migration that community WhatsApp is like the prime communication platform um, just to stay in touch with family, long distance calls that are you know, over the internet. So I feel like it's really using a medium that speaks to the audience. I do like what Uda just brought up though, about like the voyeuristic pleasure of like reading people's comment discords or in like whatever different forums and stuff like that. Like there is kind of like a, oh, I would love to see what that group chat is like kind of thing. Like, I wonder if the story is actually written in that way, like in a group chat kind of way where you're understanding the plot through the medium of WhatsApp, like the characters will actually be speaking to each other in WhatsApp, or is it just like, it's just written like anything else is written and just pasted into WhatsApp, you know, like, do they use the medium as a character in that way? Does that make sense? Yeah. I would hope they use the medium as a character. Otherwise it's a, I feel like it's a bit of a wasted opportunity. Yeah. I mean, there could be different incentives for using WhatsApp in this way, it could just be like, they want their own control over the platform. You know, they didn't want to try and find mm. someone to sponsor it or, or, you know, distribute it somewhere, you know, so it could just be like, that's where their community is. And so that's where they're going to do it. Or it could be like, oh, what an interesting use of this medium. Like, let's actually use the medium as a, mm. like, there could be different incentives, you know? WhatsApp has like stories too, right? The same as Facebook and Instagram and other Facebook products, right? Yeah. yeah, they do. So they could be, you could actually like use that to broadcast the live, gain the live content. I guess you could also, if you're just joining a chat, so you just send videos or whatever. It doesn't even require all that. Yeah, yeah you can what publish I- like a link, like a WhatsApp group link and that anybody can join kind of thing. So they probably just have like a landing page and a WhatsApp link and how I would No, that's it exactly because- it. So... Do they, do they call themselves a series? Like, what makes it a series? It's less of a series. Just it's a more of just a flow. It's just, just a <laughs> flow. It's a stream. It's not a series. Yeah, an ongoing performance or drama or... And that there is, like, some fiction to it, I guess. Deceit, betrayal, jealous, and shocking surprises in Zimbabwe's first WhatsApp drama. Do you guys remember Lonely Girl 15? Which is like a thing that was in YouTube. There was this like series on YouTube of this like random like young person who would just like put their like vlogs out there. And it, it seemed like it was like a real person and whatever. But it was actually like a fully produced show over a long period of time about their family drama and stuff. And yeah, they had like a whole like narrative arc and like family drama and all of this. But it was all told through like this person's weblogs on YouTube and like there was like fan interaction and then she would like talk to people and stuff. There was some like unhinged personality on Twitter and then three years later it was like this has been a Harvard study we are now deleting this account (laughs) do you guys remember when that happened that's I I think I would be like more intrigued if I could access this without knowing that it was produced for me you know like true voyeurism I guess like that's because that like mm. that Twitter account or like this YouTube thing that you're talking about is like you didn't realize that it was a production until afterwards, you know, so it'd be yeah. kind of like, I don't know how that would ever practically happen with this particular one that Erica brought up. But like, <laughs> I'm sure maybe cool. people somehow you just got in the fans group chat and you're like watching from the edge. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure maybe people stumble across it or they're just like added randomly because like 
it's essentially like a family group chat, right? But then you'd be like, wait, who is this family? You try, you're trying to decipher it through the narrative, I guess. It might have a bit of that like wrestling effect where you know that it parts of it are like fabricated, but then you still are like invested in the, you mm-hmm. still like believe a little bit of it to some degree. Mm-hmm. Wrestling in reality TV. Moderating a group like that with like random people just coming in and trying to like mess with like the actors and stuff. That's the new director's role. Like moderating the community. How many people are following? How many people can be on a WhatsApp chat? Too? I think it's a lot. I think it's like 100 plus. Mm-hmm. 100 plus isn't that many. It's pretty for cool. Like a, for like a media production, that's like, yeah. that's nothing, you know. But for you probably have quite like, a bit. Definitely. From a practical perspective, it is. But like in terms of like getting eyeballs on this production that you spent a lot of time creating, like 100 people is not a lot. I wonder if they do, do they have multiple conversations ongoing at once so if there's cap on their audience they have like simultaneous rooms i don't think that they do i looked at the website 256 <laughs> 256 participants they just I have like over- parallel i feel parallel overwhelmed groups. for the actors mm. but it's I like- would just be like deathly nervous of making a typo but i guess that could be my character my character yeah could just <laughs> make spelling mistakes. you need to make typos I wonder if that 256, so it says the limit of, care, of people you can have in there is 256, is what it was just saying. Yeah. But I wonder, Uda, you brought in that signal about WhatsApp not long ago. I wonder if there's like a cloned, hacked versions or whatever of WhatsApp that they might be using to allow more people in or something like that. Or if there's like, mm-hmm. there's probably something that they could figure out to have more than 256, like yeah, multiple yeah, sure. versions of the room, you know, each with 256 or something. There probably are. There's probably ways to do that. And the um, producer did say that, like, using WhatsApp did make the whole experience a little more local, I guess. So mm. maybe you will have, you'll end up having, like, a larger reach, but maybe it just ends up being, like, a 250. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I don't know what's possible on WhatsApp. Yeah, I don't know if there's, like, user permissions, too, like, where some people can talk and other people can just watch, you know, like, on, on like, Zoom, someone? for example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you meet someone and relegate them to the, like in, um, what is the clubhouse? You can like push someone off the stage back into the audience, you know? I was also thinking about like the production aspect of it. Like, are there even actors or is it one person just typing from like seven different phones at once? Like as all the different characters, you know? Maybe. (laughs) That would really lessen production costs, you know? That would be so stressful. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think they like, have, I don't think it's like super scripted. That's like my guess. I think they probably just have a like general, like it's like very character driven. So like mm-hmm. everybody has to like play a character and just like it's probably very like improv like where people are just playing out their characters in like a public setting. And then they have like general like direction from the director about like where they have to go in the story. So actually, you know, the example that Erica gave about wrestling is probably like the best example of like what this probably is a lot like in terms of like how they think about scripting and story. This as like a format is really interesting to me. Like I would love to see, I just like recently watched all of succession and like am obsessed Mm -hmm. with that twisted fucked up family. And like, I would love to see this WhatsApp of like their family, like these like megalomaniac billionaires, like, talking in the group chat like this could be like a really fun like promo tool for Mm -hmm. culty film tv shows that have like complex family or like interpersonal relationships you know it's also interesting to think about how do you convey a character through like writing instead of just like voice and visually like their texting style yeah exactly yeah they're how do they spell things (laughs) yeah are they an all lowercase person or yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) or like strictly gifts (laughs) no contractions yeah are they writing out you or are they just writing a single letter you which one is it (laughs) when what does that mean to you uh i don't know i feel like like i write out why are you uh (laughs) to me using a you a singular you is very like internet cool succinct I don't know. There's like a thing attached to it. There's like an attitude attached to it. Even if it's just for uh, ease of use or something. I don't know. I just feel like there's like a comfort with brevity and like a comfort with knowing the other person knows what you're saying. 
and like you don't have to be so formal about it there's like a casualness maybe there's like mm-hmm. maybe I'm like way too reading into my text conversations but I feel like there is like an attitude yeah, yeah, yeah. to texting you know? I think For when sure. you use it when you use a you instead of a y-o-u it's a little lighter it's like a little like you're not yeah. going to be like misconstrued as being like harsh or passive aggressive is likely or something like that you're just kind of like no this is i'm being chill yeah and then uh, when you when people put a period when they don't normally do Mm -hmm. you're like what the fuck is up what did i do (laughs) are you mad at me (laughs) (laughs) used a period instead of no period what's going on (laughs) you don't take me out anymore (laughs) (laughs) back to this uh this WhatsApp stream. Um, <laughs> what do we think it signals? Uh, uh, what it might it sing- signal? What does it mean? I don't know. I, I I think that it's a signal of just like making do with like a platform that doesn't isn't really thought of in in that way, and just doing something completely different with with film. I think there's like a bit of experimentation that I haven't seen anywhere else, to be honest. I feel like it's very like very intentional to creating content that resonates with your community of audience like using the interface and the technology that would speak to them on a day-to-day basis and also in terms of access too, like you don't need a lot of internet data to be on whatsapp and then also in terms of like low budget production and what erica was saying like local first uh, production Mm -hmm. the most interesting thing about this is just the potential for kind of like subversive media formats that, you know, kind of building on this like technocultural thing, but like kind of pushing it more into media and storytelling. Like I, I remember in the beginning of quarantine, seeing like a dating show happen in Excel spreadsheets, you know, which was really fun. I forget what it's called now, but it was so cute when it was happening. I was really a big fan of it. And then it stopped because people had other shit to do than run a dating show in Excel spreadsheets. It's not exactly a monetizable platform. Anyways, this WhatsApp story telling format I think is really interesting and I think it just speaks to like ongoing innovation in media formats you know and talking to people where they literally are within their phone you know mm-hmm. yeah like it is an example of like adaptive reuse and creative misuse which is something we've been talking a lot about on uh, the work we were doing on digital public space which is like it's kind of a perfect example of that sort of thing it's whatsapp as a digital public space there was recently some study around the phone has become like the home now and you can kind of look at it from an anthropological perspective as like the home and in the ways that people are apparently only spend most of their time in one or two rooms of their home same thing like one or two apps on their phone it's where people like retreat to and different things like that and so that was like an interesting way of thinking about it too so the idea that you would have like you know, the, I think the, the family WhatsApp group is like a thing that everybody's familiar with or many people are familiar with. And so the idea that you would have that as like uh, this like familiar place to host a, a, not really the character, but the setting of a show or some sort of theatrical experience. It makes a lot of sense and uh, it could be very compelling. So signal or noise, would it? Oh, I think it's definitely a signal for all the reasons that people said. I'm also like particularly interested in like, super interactive forms of uh, media which are like live responsive to like the particular like fan and audience context um whether it's twitch or um whatsapp said signal noise i think it's definitely a signal i'm leaning more towards like the media side of it just like what's happening in storytelling and how can we use different platforms but yeah i think it's super interesting i want to see more of this i want to join one i see yeah, Signal as well, for all the reasons, but also in terms of like how filmmaking is going towards, you know, opening it up with lower, lower barriers of entry and focusing on more local and using the tools that uh, are available to us. What you said about creative misuse of tools and subversive uses of everyday tools too. Mm-hmm. Where else would we uh, stream a show from or host a stream from? <laughs> Yeah, I like the idea that you said you said the WhatsApp like family mm. group is such a like it's such a classic concept. Like everybody kind of like knows what that means. But what's like the the living room, right? Future of the it's sitcom. The family. It's the family living room. What are like other equivalents of that? You know, somebody needs to should do the family matters WhatsApp group chat. Like you should do this with existing properties. And you have like yeah. Urkel in there, like you know, saying the wrong things and everything. 
That would be so fun. So many people would watch that for like classic family shows. The other space that I think is like really, like I think people can relate to this is like the neighborhood, like Facebook group. I'm not in one in my neighborhood, but like people I know who have like kids and like, I mean, there's like a classic like war between like people with kids and people with dogs in like a mm-hmm. lot of Facebook groups in like Toronto. So this is like <laughs> completely news to me. If you had to sum up Toronto in like one way. <laughs> <laughs> There's two gangs in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> parents with kids, parents with dogs. Yeah, or yeah. non-parents with dogs, dog owners. For parents, what are they called? Dog parents? Dog parents. Dog parents. And kid parents. Kid parents and people with no money. Yeah, yeah. It's a fact. It's beef in the parks. The work slack. Yeah, you could do a good office. There was a book written in, a, in the format of a work slack uh it came mm. out recently i i was reading a, like a review about it or an article that mentioned it yeah and it, it was kind of like to speak to the similarities between like the work slack one and this whatsapp one like the work slack one i guess the only permission setting in slack where you can see everyone's comments is like god mode you know it's like the it's like super user boss mode where you can see everything that's happening and so reading a book from that position is different than reading it from a WhatsApp, which is like more egalitarian. Like everyone sees everything, you know, but in the mm-hmm. Slack, only the boss sees everything. So you're like kind of assuming the role of the boss or the God of the Slack when you're reading. Is that it. really it's what it's like? like? Like you can read DMs and stuff. I think so. Slack. Yeah. I mean, you shouldn't be, don't be like putting your salacious shit in your work Slack. Come on. Yeah. Just like, <laughs> just like in zoom, I don't know if they've changed it, but this is how it was last year. The private chat in zoom gets published like when you download your zoom recording you can download a transcript of the chat and the private chat is in there too so like don't be talking shit in your private zoom chat because someone's gonna see it Mm. really (laughs) yeah apparently i don't know like i've never had it happen to me but i had someone warn me about it and that's what i've just passed that message on in case anyone that's funny there's something about that zoom chat that that just always seemed a little too precarious for me to like say anything (laughs) the toggle down between different people like nah that's like slippery ux right exactly slippery ux that's a good word for that (laughs) yeah that's what that is yeah it's like if i have like a boss and like you know the guy i'm seeing if their name starts with the same letter it's like i'm gonna write boss in front of my person's like the boss's name so that i don't accidentally type in the wrong one you know like yeah it's so easy you can't be like switching so among things it's like yeah it's quite elegant in its way but also reckless yeah. and risky okay macy what's your weak signal not super weak but i was watching a documentary called river runner the other day and it's about a kayaker and then i became interested in rivers and i stumbled across this open source interactive map called river runner that essentially takes you on a ride along the path of uh, any location in the US. So essentially you basically become a raindrop um, and you can select any location. You can also type in an address. You can tap on the roof of your house and it would map the downwards flow of um, that raindrop into ultimately the ocean. So it's using like public Hydro- hydrology data from the U.S. Geological Survey and the um, the creator mapped out the flow path of water from every single location. Although it doesn't take into account where like water might have dropped off or evaporated or being pulled out into a treatment plant, but it was just really interesting like to be able to have this kind of immersive look at the interconnectedness of river systems, watersheds, how the different behavior of Water flow goes from, you know, different uh, parts of the states and looking at like the continental divide and just, yeah, following a path that goes all the way from like Wyoming to the Gulf of Mexico. Also, just like to understand kind of like the fastness and interconnectedness of. So, for example, like your upstream behavior um, could have a lot of implications on like the mass amounts of population downstream um, in thinking about pollution or, or other types of water usage and as well as making use of public data to really allow people to experience and empathize with environmental systems. Another thing that I've read about it is people have also called it like meditative armchair travel, which I guess like with the pandemic, it's kind of gone um, popular. 
yeah, I was just playing around with that. For Is that a new a genre, spend, meditative armchair travel? I spent hours on this website. Macy, just oh, so on this one. yeah, oh, yeah. Fun, I right? just like the way I do it. Actually, is just like just randomly, I'll put a drop on somewhere on the map and just like have it running in the background. It's like like almost like a screensaver. Sometimes yeah. I'll just have it on my projector, just playing in the back. And you mm-hmm. can change the um, speed of it as well. Or share your screen if you want to show us a. Yeah. Oh, this is it's like really well done. So I can just like drop. I put a drop Baker Montana. Um, maybe this is a really complicated path yeah sometimes it does take a little while to process if it's a really long path from what i remember though there are no paths not in the u.s because i remember trying to like yeah process. it's only limited it's to only in the u.s yeah in the u.s yeah because yeah, it's, it's using u.s data only are they doing anything with this website like are they connecting it to other projects or is there like a call to action afterwards like learn more about where your water comes from kind of thing or is it meant to be kind of like you you make what you make what you want out of this well i think the intent behind it is in to raise awareness of the implications of water use and i think there's definitely a lot of uptake from educators teachers in yeah using it as a tool for for teaching but what did you learn from it i was just playing with it forever it kind of reminds me of that native land site, like open source, like learn about your geographic surroundings, learn about the like, implications of your actions kind of thing. They're, they're sort of similar. Yeah, I'm always kind of interested about stuff like this, like a, such a labor intensive project, surely, you know, like with so much data built into it, like how can this be extended or layered on top of something else? Or how can something be layered on top of it? Like what else could you do with this information? I, I kind of wish it did more, maybe. I don't know. Or I imagine how it could do more. Yeah, it is functioning as a base. And he's open sourced everything and is encouraging other people to use it. Do you know if it's used for like water level monitoring? Because similarly, I'm always interested if like, yeah, with that information, how a community ends up like using it if there's like, I don't know, less water in the river or, or even like a sea level type thing or an overflow of water at a certain period, like how that might help a community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting if it's like paired with weather data and be used as like a forecasting tool. Like how Google Maps added in the fire feature, which is super depressing, but actually very helpful. You can see where wildfires are near you. And I don't know if it's rolled out everywhere, but I've, I saw it in BC over the summer. It, like there were those crazy floods in New York this summer as well. And I, it would be interesting if like a site like this could react to real time data and like kind of tell you like, okay, if there's a flood over here, then the water is going to fall downstream. And then, you know, this place is going to be next because it's not like the average person really has an understanding of how that works. I don't understand how the weather works. I don't know. I might have a different take on this, but I just, I kind of think like, you can build standalone apps that don't do that much and Mm -hmm. that's just like what they're for and this is just like a purely like this is just a visualization of where where the water flows and that's it and it's simple and like that's what it does and it's kind of (laughs) great for what it does Mm -hmm. i don't know if it needs to be doing much much more i guess like they made it open source people if somebody wants to do something with it they can Yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily think this person like Sam Lerner has a responsibility to do more with it. You know, the fact that he made it open source suggests that he sees other ways it could be used as well, or she, I don't know who Sam Lerner is. And I'm curious about what you could do with this amount of data, like, you know, across the whole US, like that's wild. I don't even understand how you can make something like this. Like, you know, I'm curious about what else could be layered on top. Not that, not that this person has a responsibility to do that themselves understanding these waterways better probably has like some very specific stories attached to them as well. Like it is just data at the moment, but yeah, there's like the local narrative to and relationship to the water and then how they're connected and where the water flows, like then tells a story of like what's in the water, how that travels, even like ecologically, what like migration patterns are what for that biodiversity. But from what I'm getting, it just shows like where the water flows doesn't have all that information, but there is like the opportunity, I guess, or the possibility mm-hmm. for that to be added by the community if it's open source, I guess. But yeah, I like the idea of like connecting through waterways, whether it's the rivers mm-hmm. or, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely so, a sense of connection by like 
following that and having a better understanding, especially of the waterways around you. It's a great tool for that, I think. And it's kind of a hard thing to get context of just by like, say, living in a city or living wherever you live. Sorry, I was just going to add that they actually do that in Orangeville. They have like a community that connects all the waterways and um, it's called Headwaters and it's like to navigate like the health of the region, but then also connect the community through the rivers. So those like smaller stories that are attached and those like relationships to the river are really, really nice. Yeah, I mean, I was like reading Reddit comments or people commenting on plotting the point from beside their house or whatever and people connecting through other people's comments about where the water is flowing from where they are. Maybe in other places, these kinds of community-based groups like Headwaters could surface. This is one of like a, a couple of things that I've kind of noticed around, you know, I don't know what group of people are, are using this, like what the community is, but I feel like it is similar to that, that Native Lands site that I brought up earlier, where there's just kind of like an interest of like this generation from this generation who like maybe are mainly based in cities to like have a stronger connection to the land and use technology in order to build that connection or start mm. to like have the pathways to do that. You know, like I think that there's like different apps that you can use to help like identify bird calls and stuff, you know, like that type of thing where technology is a mediator to, or like a, a gateway to deeper connection to the land. So I think that that's really interesting as well. One thing I was thinking about when I was playing with this right now is like a recent trip after a very long time went camping and I realized like how much of like what I was doing when I was like setting up my campsite was like just thinking about like the flow of water like potential flow of water and potential flow of air right you're just thinking about like okay how do I set up this tent so that the water doesn't get into my tent or whatever like those are just things we don't think like I, I never think about that I never think about like where water is coming and going from when I'm living in the city mm -hmm. um but like, you know, all our trade routes, like the placement of cities in this country, they're all like migration patterns. They're all com completely determined by these like waterways. That's where cities have been built and roadways have been built and what shape like, you know, I think I spent a lot of time thinking about the internet. That's how that's like the, and that's how this kind of like downstream effect on like the infrastructure of the internet and like how optical fibers are laid and things like that. And so much of this is like, so connected back to the land and we we forget all the time you know so it's interesting that people are finding new ways to connect to the land but it's not it, it's hard to be experiential right mm -hmm. like how do you get to that uh, if you're you know thinking about like abstract things sitting in the city and talking about whatsapp shows and crypto and like what the fuck we talk about <laughs> it also i feel like there's a general interest in like macro systems i noticed mm. from last year when people were talking about like there's going to be a supply toilet paper chains. outage you know supply yeah. chain had any of us maybe like the average person contemplated supply chain ever in their life like supply chain is incredibly difficult to like wrap your head around like i can't really wrap my head around it mm. and so i feel like while this is not explicitly supply chain i feel like it is a macro system it and it kind of is yeah you know i think that there is i mean it's like it's the it's god's supply chain you know it's like the first supply chain ever i don't know um but like i think it is like the popularity of things like this that allow you to like envision your place in like a larger system is like a thing that's also happening a friend mm. of mine berkeley who lives here in vancouver she was telling me how she like likes to use this app. I think it's called like marine traffic or something like that. Maybe it's called something else. And it lets you see what all the giant ships in Vancouver are carrying. Like there are all these like, mm. like giant container like, ships. Yeah, sure. We're called them container ships. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, so she likes to look on this app to see what the container ships that are currently parked in the port, like, what they are carrying and where they came from. And she said, it's like her version of Pokemon Go. Like she said, mm -hmm. oh, this one's from Korea. This one's from wherever. This one's carrying grain. This one's carrying gravel, like whatever, you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. like another one of those kind of like, what is, what are these systems that are sustaining my life? Like I should know more about this, you know? We spent the last, like, I don't know, a few decades, like trying to like remove ourselves from being able to like control our lives in a way that like, can like remove us from these systems but it's like those abstractions are really leaky you can't like you still are connected mm -hmm. and you know i think that's people are like catching on to that COVID is like a clear trigger point where people realize that 
yeah, we removed ourselves from these things, but this, these are all leaky abstractions that we built and you have to like be able to peer into the systems that are sustaining everything that we've, that we've built on top of um, to get to where we are. All right. Signal your noise, Udit. I love this I like app, but I think it's noise in the sense that this is just like, it's like a ton of like really cool, beautiful visualizations on the internet about different things. And this is just cool. another one of them. Erica. It is a bit noisy, but I also have this like appreciation for such a grand scale mapping project. And there is a lot of potential and possibility of like and what can be done and how a community adheres to it. I think waterways are super interesting because specifically fishing is a very old system. I want to know what the evolution of that is, I guess, of like an age old system and Mm -hmm. connecting through mapping projects like this. So I'm going to say it's a signal. (laughs) And that's it. I feel like there is something signal-ish about some part of this, like something connected to just like, infrastructure and wanting to move away from like those abstractions that Uda was mentioning, you know, Mm. like the thing I was thinking about was like, okay, when you're on Uber eats and there's like those four stages and it's like, they've received your order, they're preparing it. And you see the little gif of like the hand making the salad or whatever the fuck, would it be helpful at all? Or would that ever change to be more explicit in some way? Like more, like show me what's actually happening. Like show me more than just the driver taking a route. I don't know. That's just where my brain was going. Like transparency and systems and wanting to move away from these abstractions that actually like this ignorance is not blissful, you know, like this ignorance is not helping us. Is there something there, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. Things like supply chain transparency. I feel like they always sound better than they are. And I don't really want to spend time looking at them, but I like to be able to know. And yeah, when it's beautiful, I feel like this was like a bit of an overpromise. this one though, in terms of like becoming a raindrop. I want to become a raindrop, but this was like a small aircraft and a flight simulator, Microsoft program or something. But it's good information, dense and efficient, like a raindrop, not lazy and lackadaisical, like a snowflake signal. Sid, what's your weakest signal? Maybe giving an intro to my signal that I'm kind of noticing these two growing kind of opposed social forces. One is like intense sex positivity and the other is like intense sexual conservatism and like intense, like locking down on like sex and sexuality and like, you know, everything that stems out of that, which is basically everything, but whatever. The reason I was thinking about that partially because of like the abortion ban in Texas, but more recently and like less depressing is um, that it was New York Fashion Week. It was Fashion Month. Uh, if And uh, one of my favorite fashion writers, Rachel Tashin for GQ, wrote about sexy clothes in America. Um, it's not really the exact same thing that's happening in Milan or Paris or whatever, but in American brands specifically, there's like this sexy clothing thing happening. I don't know if you noticed in the past summer that people are like dressing more expressively, I've seen articles write it as like dopamine dressing and like just people really being friggin' out there with their clothes. Like I've seen a lot of women's wear that's been like super tight, like stretchy things, just like nipples showing everywhere, skin revealed in all these places, holes in sweaters where there shouldn't be holes. Like skin is showing, sex is out there. You know, it's like, it's in the air. And like, this is what Rachel was kind of writing about in her article. Um, I'll link it in the chat so you guys can kind of scroll through as I'm talking. And, you know, that got me thinking about what is going on in like the popular consciousness in relation to sex. And I think, you know, working kind of backwards in a timeline this past summer, I think has been like very expressive. I think there's been like a lot of like really fun, like underground queer raves. And like, there's a lot of like crazy, like expression happening because people have felt repressed for a long time. Last year, obviously people felt repressed, but we also had like the WAP song, which was my last signal last time I came on this show. Then before that, we kind of had like this kind of like ironic sex thing happening on social media where people were like horny on main, you know, and like they were like subversive tweets and like uh, people kind of talking about how horny they are, but like in an ironic internet way. And then before that, we had Me Too, which was like, sex is scary and we're all scared to talk about it. It's all fucked. And like, we're all like, it's all really tense, you know? So I think we've kind of gone through these waves of like, ah, like 
everything about sex is fraught because we have me too. And then we have this kind of like, I am interested in sex, but I'm going to be ironic about it. So I don't show my true vulnerability. But then now I feel like we're actually in like an earnest, like I want to have sex, like genuine expression, social moment. And so my signal is specifically New York Fashion Week, women's sexy clothing, women's and men's sexy clothing. But I think that it indicates a genuine acceptance of like sex positivity in the past, which I think has been more ironic and more kind of like people not being comfortable really saying what they want. But now I think it's like, it's more like I'm free and I'm ready to live in the moment and I'm going to talk about what I want. And I think like that'll have repercussions in like the different types of porn that we get. I think that we'll get like a wider variety, higher production value, people being less scared to participate in that different porn media, different porn technology. I think like sex, sex accessories, mainstreaming and gentrification of sex shops, like all of the commercial stuff that can come from like a social shift like this, like really breaking through the mainstream. Cause obviously this has always been there. Like sex is like the primary use of any new technology, but like really Mm -hmm. the mainstreaming of it, um, I think is particularly interesting. Cause I just think people are really earnestly horny now in a way in the past, they've been like kind of ironically horny or like sarcastically horny you know but I feel like it's really genuine and like really palpable now so that's my signal thanks for coming to my TED talk (laughs) (laughs) I mean it sounds like the signal comes from multiple sources for you but one is just like what was happening at fashion week and is it Rachel Tashin's uh read of it yeah Um, her read of it and like yeah just the past summer of like women's wear particularly mm -hmm. I've noticed yeah, some of those things for sure. And I've definitely noticed. And like, there's a different vibe about it as well. I think like the attitude of sexy does feel different. And that's like the, to me, that's where I'm like, because I, I would be skeptical in some ways. A lot of this feels like, uh, like someone's always saying this, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. like, you, it's like an argument, the argument of this being a signal, I feel like is something you can make almost at any time. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to be like, okay, what feels different? But I do think that in the fashion, there is something that is different. I don't know exactly how to articulate that as like a wholesomeness. I don't know. Maybe that's what you were saying, like the genuineness. Like how do you like take this mix of like sexiness with like wholesomeness as opposed to edginess? Yeah, something that I thought was notable about like Rachel Tashin's read of like how sexiness has evolved in American fashion is like she kind of talks about how 2019 was really kind of like uh, identity politics driven dressing where it's like really bold and brash and like the Met Gala theme that year was camp, you know, just like theatrical Mm -hmm. over the top. Like Mm -hmm. she has this quote, it was like something like a a defensive pose or a defensive perspective that's actually like dressed as like really outlandish dressing. So you dress in, in huge colors and crazy patterns, but you're actually like defending yourself with clothing that bold. But now I feel like the clothing is like thin and it's like stuck to your skin and there's holes in it. And it's like very transparent and it's, it's not a performance of sex. sex. It's an actual sexual desire, you know, Mm. like it's an actual, a a kind of more vulnerable uh, position of sexuality and, you know, self-expression rather than a performance of it. Mm -hmm. Like an embodiment of it or something rather than. Mm -hmm. The first thing that came to mind for some reason was thirst boss, thirst keep, thirst light. What is that? <laughs> it's not anything. It's it's like you know the girl boss gatekeep oh, gaslight, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but just in a but in a thirsty, just like a completely thirsty way. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what it is in juxtaposition to like at one point in in fashion history when like knees weren't allowed being shown or something. So like mm-hmm. you, everyone wore like things that would reveal the knee or something. So I'm trying to think of like, what is the opposition to that? And I think you've mentioned it. I'm just trying to pinpoint it again. Tangible, like tactical, like you want to touch the things that you're, that's like at least how I Yeah, feel. yeah. It's like very, okay. like sexuality comes out like in a very like sensory way as opposed to like a more kind of like abstract way to like edginess or to like performance or to mm-hmm. like whatever. Yeah. Can I share my screen? Is that, yeah. is that mm-hmm. possible? I can show you guys some of the things that I'm thinking about. Oh, that's sorry. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say, like, you've mentioned, like, these, like, very extravagant forms of sexuality, like that camp in America. And, like, Mm -hmm. perhaps this is a reaction to that, where it's like, 
it's still sexy, but it's just a little more dis- it's distilled in a different way. That's not so like la- maybe extravagant. Is it more like sensual as opposed to like primarily sensual? No, it's sensual like maybe. it's like a nice word. It's like sexy. It's like like hookup apps. I'm DTF. Like sexy. Like you guys can see this right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like super tight fitted. There's like skin revealed. Like one of the things that Rachel says in this article is like, oh, you might find yourself daydreaming of like someone's exposed upper ribs, you know, and like just that kind of stuff, which I guess is sensual. Mm-hmm. Like what Macy was saying. One of the coats like that she really identified as like of the moment is this one from a Luar show. And just like the way she kind of depicted it in a social setting, like imagine creeping your hand up that person's chest underneath the, the little band across the top of the jacket. Like it's, it's like, it's actually sexy, you know, like the skin is exposed. It's out there. It's like, there's something tactile to it. You know, there's not something performative to this. It's like right there, you know, this is, one way of how this might have been created but i mean also it is like it's real also like we do feel repressed and we do feel like cloistered i don't know i kind of want to see like what is like like what's actually like happening on the streets too as opposed to like what we're seeing on the runway Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i feel like the thing that like i observed over the past kind of six months in the summer is like people wearing like tiny little like nothing tops that barely even count Mm. as clothing you know Mm. like strappy something everything's just locked in somehow but like it's barely there you know like this is Mm. this is like the thing with fashion week though is like this is labeled as next year's clothing but like in order for it to work next year people have to relate to it right now right so like it is still kind of robbie brought up what are the time scales is like technically this clothing is going to be released in spring summer of next year but like Mm it resonates right now because like, this is the feeling that we're feeling right now. Right. So like it, it, it like fits with what people's like, what people are like hungry for, I guess. But I think I see this happening in like fashion is something that I'm really drawn to. I feel like it, it like in terms of self-expression, like fashion style, et cetera, says a lot about our cultural moment, but then like, you can also think of that show sex education that came out on Netflix. And like this most recent season has been really popular um, amongst a larger audience. And it's, it's about like young people talking about sex and like figuring out how to deal with it. And it's really great. It's like a really great, honest portrayal of like sexual desire and kink and all this kind of stuff at like a young age. So like in terms of time scales, I feel like this is kind of like happening now, you know, like this yeah. kind of cultural shift is happening now. But like, I think to me, the signal is like what will happen commercially in response to the cultural shift which is like what I mentioned about media and technology, like porn media, porn technology, sex accessory brands, mainstreaming of sex shops, which like I've always been in like fucking dungeons and basements places, you know, like Mm. actually like, you know, the gentrification of all that kind of stuff, which like I'm not necessarily endorsing, but I think that is already happening and will continue to happen. So you started with, I see two opposing forces. Mm. What's, can you talk about the opposing you talked about this, but yeah, just right. like the mainstreaming. What is like the opposing force that you're seeing? Yeah. I mean, like the biggest example of it is like the abortion ban in Texas and Mississippi. And to me, that's like, there's like, there's lots of other kind of examples of that kind of stuff, I think. But like, that's the main one where I'm like, okay, you start to see like conservative policy reacting to like cultural progressive freedoms. Right. And like, I think mm-hmm. I feel like also you know, another example of that, not in the same realm is like the amount of hate crimes that have sprung up in response to like the amount of like actual POC representation that exists, you know, like there's a cultural shift and there's kind of a backlash. Um, And I feel like culturally, we're always kind of like pushing and pulling. Hopefully we're going to win out. I don't know. We'll see. But that's what I see as kind of the the tension is like Mm -hmm. a lot of fear mongering and a lot of genuine fear about what's happening with that abortion ban and will it trickle to other states and will it influence the government as a whole? And then will the U.S. government influence other countries that are more progressive too? Uh, I was thinking, I was wondering if you were seeing a sort of like a type of conservatism also in like among like progressive people. I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's like, there's like a movement a couple of years ago, people like almost kind of like trad movement, like people are talking about like being like progressive people being like yeah like trad wives and like wanting to be like um, modest and like the cottage core trad yeah, like really really cottage yeah. like cottage core trad wives is like very That's close true. aesthetically mm-hmm. yeah and i was just wondering how they kind of like fit together 
Yeah, like I feel like the thing that I remember seeing kind of last year, like a little bit of this year too, but I feel like it really peaked like last year and maybe the year before fashion wise was like those like crazy prairie dresses. There you go. That's the word I'm looking for. Like it's crazy plaid. It has like these big sleeves. It has like a crazy like collar, scalloped collar and it's like very cottage core um, vibes. Yeah, it's like... um, (laughs) Uh, horse girl energy kind of like braids like long braids that's just what I see when I see those dresses you know um yeah yeah, so I I wonder what is what is the kind of relationship between those two things I feel like one is like the subversion of the other like you're what are you wearing underneath your period dress but I was gonna say something similar between the two of you where it's like the cutouts in places you can't imagine is always kind of like in relationship to that conservatism like it's like Mm -hmm. you should be able to wear whatever you want no one should have anything to say about it and not wear a top if you don't want to like through the nipple type movements where Mm -hmm. it's like there shouldn't be any judgment over like how much you've you've exposed or anything but this I feel like is more like tighter fits I don't know I think I'm thinking about like yeah, in response to conservatism a little bit, which you've mentioned, you've gone over, but then also just the material that's being used. It's like scuba wear. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> so I'm like, are, are they also just preparing for like any <laughs> environmental, they're preparing environmental for sweat consciousness at any time, sweat or precipitation, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Sweat, water, and heat. And it just happens to be sexy because it's tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I guess Udit, like the, I was thinking about the dresses while Erica's talking. And I think that is kind of like the campier side of things, you know, like what I was kind of mentioning before, like the performance of the character and the performance of like loud outlandish clothing as a defensive mode of dressing, Mm -hmm. you know, like I'm going to wear this dress that like puffs out literally three feet on either side. Like you can't touch me. Like, you don't know what I look like. I have control over that. Like, you don't know what my body looks like. I have control over that. I'm going to shroud it in this giant prairie dress, you know? versus seeing more kind of like revealing clothing, there is a vulnerability that comes with that, right? Like someone mm-hmm. can see exactly what your body looks like whenever you want. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a power in that, but there's also, there could be some danger in that. But I feel like it's like that kind of spontaneity and desire to live in the moment, which is kind of like the feeling that people have a little bit right mm-hmm. now because we've been repressed for so long. And I think it's really genuine. You know, I think it's really earnest. What, is, what do you think, Signal? And I I think that Sid's like pointing out something that's like really interesting, which is like, she's, she's pointing out an instance of something happening in fashion, which is like reflective of like a broader thing, which is happening, which is like people care about real things as opposed to abstract things more and more in different places, partially because of like where we are historically, contextually and post pandemic. So I would say it's a signal of that, which is real wins over abstract after we survive a global pandemic. Erica, what do you think? I think it has the potential to precipitate into like a lot of other things aesthetically. Like I'm thinking just now of like cozy web. Mm-hmm. Like, but like <laughs> <laughs> but cozy we, have, web. we already have a cozy. That's what OnlyFans is. That's a cozy oh, that's true. Web. I feel like OnlyFans is less cozy now. It got Tumblr, it got, you know? Yeah, yeah, it got too, yeah. It's Maybe WhatsApp is sure. cozy. No, it's not. I don't know what's cozy anymore. But I was also going to say maybe it's a reflection of, because it is happening, so it's like maybe it's a reflection of being online and having the comforts of, like, being able to wear certain things in the comfort of, like, your space. And, like, then you end up going out and seeing it on the, like, streets or whatever. But, like, that there's a certain culture being fostered online in a certain way. And then that's also then uh, ending up elsewhere. But I, I do think it's a signal um just because I think I like your juxtaposition between camp and conserve and like how conservatism fits from there or, like is like evolving from that campy expression of sexuality Macy what do you think I think it's just like a recurring signal of like post-crisis mode and wanting to be free and mm. wanting to shed excess and almost coming out of confinement like I mean it's like you know in 60s summer of love post Vietnam war that kind of liberation Mm. and then I guess for us it's like almost 
like after this period of confinement and restriction, like how can we like then, yeah, subvert that into something that's like sexy and embracing vulnerability and like, yeah, exposing our bodies in, in, yeah, in genuine ways that like we couldn't before. And maybe we've been able to develop connections in, in ways that we haven't been able to before. And now we're exploring that. So I would say it's just very reflective of our, our times right now. And mm-hmm. maybe it's just like type of recurring signal of, yeah, this like post-crisis mode. Mm-hmm. The Summer of Love is a good analog, I think, because there's mm-hmm. like some of the very same sorts of issues uh, in the air at this time. So the question then would be for me, is like if this is a signal, for this to be rated as a signal, we have to really be saying that we think this signals that A, that this sort of present day sex positivity movement is like, well, or we can at least compare or contrast with like the sexual liberation movement of like the late 60s. Mm-hmm. What do we think about that? I don't think I know enough about like who was allowed to be a part of that movement to actually like be able to differentiate the two. That would be the first place I look to look for differentiation is like who was allowed to be a part of like the summer of love. Like were queer people and trans people allowed in that? Were like people of color? Were you know, what, like how, how, what did that look like and who was represented? I don't know enough about it, to be honest. I mean, I think that, Eric, broadly, I, I think as a, yeah, as a broad answer, my, my view would be like, yes, it was like the, the spirit of it was broad. But I don't know that does that even affect whether you think something of the same magnitude is happening through the signal, you know what I mean? Well, I guess like the reason that I bring up that differentiation is like, because there are still kind of gradations within sexual liberation you know it didn't just like happen in the 60s and then we like stop moving you know like there's a lot of people left Mm -hmm. out of that period right like and so I think like even comparing what was happening in like 2019 with a hot girl summer which you could call Mm -hmm. as like a signal of sexual liberation I think is still different than what is happening now you know I Mm -hmm. think that that was kind of coded in a level of like irony and performance like Mm -hmm. I'm going to perform as a hot girl you know Mm -hmm. versus I feel like now what we're kind of seeing is like a little bit more just like genuine honesty like not performing a character but just expressing your like weird freaky hot gross sexuality the way that it actually is showing your like crazy fucked up body because everyone has crazy fucked up bodies you know like just letting mm-hmm. it show you know so I guess yeah it, to come to the, back to your question of like for this mm-hmm. to be a signal it has to be different is like I think that there are still gradations if you really do a close reading of them yeah 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 and I think there would have to be because otherwise I mean if it was just a repeat and this wouldn't and be a signal right yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. so that yeah. and so I, I, I hear you and probably on the how it over like the overlap with body positivity and things like that it feels like that's something that's just still in quite an early stage in terms mm-hmm. of like where it'll be that like five years ago will look feel very stone age in regards to how we think about bodies and in, mm-hmm. in 10 years or something that reads to me like the sex sirens category in like a ball like but i do mm-hmm. think that sexuality does take a certain level of performance and then getting to that place of like flow state is yeah. like how sex sirens always comes off to me mm. um at, which is like this celebration of sexuality in this very overt way and it is a performance but it still comes off as like just complete flow state of like just per- just do sexuality and do you broadcast um, from later <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> 